So in this last lecture video for the week, we're gonna talk about how you're most likely to interact with R, which is using uh, data sets and some of the functions and functionality in R to kind of manipulate and, and, uh, and analyze data. Uh, so R includes uh, several different example data frames that you can use to kind of see what's going on. Uh, just kind of use as an example. Uh, one of them is this uh, data set called MT cars, which gives us some information about cars. So it's already loaded into R and we can just call it to take a look at what a data set, or in this case, a data frame, how that looks in R. So uh, I just in this case, I just call this function head, which just limits us the first six observations of the data set and then we punch in empty cars and so we can get the, uh, the the first six observations for this empty cars data frame and so we can see here we've got the name of a car the mileage per gallon the number of cylinders the engine displacement and so on uh, where each row corresponds to a an observation or a different model of car and then each column corresponds to a different kind of characteristic of the car uh, we're probably going to want to access elements of a data frame uh, in one way or another, either rows or columns, and we can do it just as treating the treating the data frame just like a matrix. So if we want to pull out a row, remember we can access a row of a matrix by using this bracket where we just fill in the first argument. So in this case, three comma blank is going to pull out the third row, and so we can see that on the Datsun seven ten. We also might want to pull out just a column. We might want to pull out, you know, access the cylinder variable, for example. And we can do that by pulling out columns, just like with a matrix. So empty cars, and then in the bracket, a blank, and then comma two is going to pull out the second uh, variable, which in this case, the first variable is MPG, the second variable is cylinder. That pulls out just the cylinder variable. Uh, and so now we just have this vector of, of cylinder, uh, of the number of cylinders. Another way we can access variables in a data frame is using the dollar sign. So instead of, you know, this is equivalent, empty cars bracket comma two is exactly equivalent to typing in empty cars dollar sign and then the name of that second variable, CYL, where we pull out the second, uh, that second variable either way to do it the same. So if you were wanting to you know, manipulate a, data, a given variable or something, you could, you could call it either way. Um, so for example, you may wanna add new variables to a data frame. A lot of times we wanna kind of uh, you know, manipulate data frame uh, variables to add new ones, add a couple of variables together or divide or you know, something. Um, so in this case, we can create new variables in a data frame we can kind of add a new variable by just creating a new uh, object in some sense, which is empty cars, dollar sign, whatever we want the name of the new variable to be. That's gonna basically reach into the empty cars data frame and add this new variable called ID. And so in this case, we can just add, I was just doing this as an example, we can assign to that ID variable, just one all the way up through the number of rows. So that's just gonna go down row, go down the rows, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and so on until we hit the bottom of the data frame, just assigning a unique number to each, uh, to each row. Maybe we wanna, for example, calculate the power to weight ratio. Uh, that, that would be horsepower divided by weight. So now we can create another new variable, MT cars dollar sign PTW power to weight ratio, and we're gonna to assign to that. Right, what we wanna do is divide, do horsepower divided by weight. So we have to tell R in the empty cars data frame, access the horsepower variable and divide that by in the empty cars data frame, the weight variable. Um, and so we can see here, we've added an ID variable, we've added a power to weight variable, if we call empty cars again, it looks exactly like it did before. Uh, it's spilled over here, so it's kind of hard to, to see. This should probably be easier if you call it on your own uh, RStudio uh, on your own computer. 
But then you can see we've added two new variables here, ID and power to weight ratio. But I think this gets a little clunky, right? Like in, especially in the second example, we have to keep telling it in MT cars, I want to make this new variable, which is comprised of a variable from MT cars divided by another variable from MT cars. We just have to keep using MT cars again and again. Um, is there a better way to do this? And the answer is yes. There is a package called dplyr uh, that is designed for data manipulation in R. It's part of the tidyverse. If you remember back to the functions and packages uh, lecture, I, I installed and loaded tidyverse. It includes a number of packages, one of which is dplyr. So if you're still working through all that code, tidyverse should already be installed and loaded from that earlier code. Uh, dplyr uh, is described as being a quote unquote grammar of data manipulation. The idea being that your data compose the kind of subjects and objects of your analysis. And then dplyr is gonna provide the verbs that you use in your manipulation and analysis. So for example, there's a mutate function that adds new variables, select that picks variables, filter that picks observations, arrange that changes the order of observations, and summarize using either the American or the British spelling that summarizes multiple observations. We'll talk about each one of these in more detail, but those are the five main verb, ver uh, verb functions of dplyr that you're going to use a lot when you're trying to do some data manipulation and analysis. So the first one is mutate. Uh, that's how you add new variables to dplyr. And the way it works is mutate first takes a data frame as its first argument, and then a flexible number of new names and values of variables. So let's see it in an example. I think that's gonna be the best way. We're gonna say we want MT, our MT cars data frame to be, we're gonna start with MT cars and we're gonna mutate by adding ID, which is one through N. The num N here is gonna pull out the number of rows in the data frame. Then PTW equals HP divided by WT. Notice we don't have to keep putting MT cars in front of everything. We've kind of like already told it inside the function, everything we're doing is inside the MT cars data frame. So we don't have to keep referring to MT cars over and over again. Uh, whereas if you look back on one of those previous slides, we kind of had to use MT cars like in every single place. Now we just have to specify it once and the mutate function knows we're working in the same data frame for everything we're doing. So now we can once again call, call the head of uh, MT cars and we get, it looks exactly the same uh, for weird reasons that we don't need to get into. The names of the cars have been dropped in favor of just giving numbers, um, but the actual data of miles per gallon, cylinders, et cetera, uh, are all still there and exactly the same as they were before. Uh, which I think this highlights one uh, really oftentimes good, but sometimes annoying thing about R, which is there are always many ways to do something. We could have used, we, we created ID and power to weight ratio one way a couple slides ago, and now we're doing it a completely different way using mutate um, to get us to the same place, but there are lots of ways to do it. I think in a lot of cases that ends up being good, um, but in some cases it can be uh, uh, a little annoying, especially when you're trying to share your code with others and you might wanna do something one way and they might wanna do it another way and then uh, uh, it can create some kind of stylistic inconsistencies, but, 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 but that's minor. At this point, I think having the flexibility to do things multiple ways is, is probably a good thing for you. Um, okay, so that was just an example. We'll go through all of these, um, all these, all these functions as we go through this lecture here over the next few minutes. Um, but one thing I want to bring up is that tidyverse doesn't just introduce these dplyr functions; it also introduces a new kind of data frame called the tibble. Um, tibble is actually the name of a package that has the code to create these things that we call tibbles, but really the class of object is a TBL underscore DF. That's like a Tibble data frame is what that stands for. But most people will just say Tibble. Um, it's kind of a weird word, but that's what we call it. Um, so I'm probably gonna use the term Tibble and data frame from here on out interchangeably, almost always meaning Tibble. 
this kind of special tidy verse version of a data frame. So what makes a tibble better than a data frame? Well, data frames sometimes exhibit some kind of weird behaviors when you try to like name variables or try to convert variable types. It does some weird things. And so uh, tibbles are often uh, smarter about some of those kind of weird edge cases that you might run into uh, with things like naming and converting. Also, uh, tibbles are smarter about how much data they show you when you call them. Uh, it kind of like knows how your RStudio is arranged, and so it knows how many uh, variables it can show you before spilling over uh, and having to use extra lines. It also just shows you the first 10 observations by default. So you don't have to use like head, that head function to suppress the number of, of uh, uh, lines that you show. Uh, so dplyr also comes with some example tibbles that we can use in, in our kind of example manipulation here. In particular, there's this one called Star Wars, which lists a bunch of characters in the various Star Wars movies and, and other uh, related media. So we can see here, we've got, uh, we just type in Star Wars, it pulls up, it tells us it's a tibble that is 87 rows by 14 uh, variables. Name, it tells us that this is, that name is a character variable. So that's kind of helpful. That wasn't in just the normal data frame. Height, which is an integer, mass, which is a double, and so on. It only shows us as many, uh, as many variables as we have space for here. And then it just tells us here at the bottom, we've got 77 more rows that it's not showing us and six more variables that it's not showing us, but it lists what those are. So that, I, I think this is really nice when you're just wanting to take a quick look at your data. It, it doesn't inadvertently show you like, hundreds of variables when you only have room to show eight or something like that. Um, but anyway, let's, let's keep talking about dplyr and let's play around with those dplyr functions, those verbs on this Star Wars um, tibble. So we already talked about the mutate function. The next one that I mentioned when we talked about uh, dplyr was select, which we can use to pick out uh, certain variables. So this is super easy. We just, uh, it, it works just like mutate where the first object that, or the first argument is the name of a, a, a data frame or a tibble. And then we can just list whatever variables we want to pull out of that tibble. So in this case, we just say select Star Wars, comma name, comma homeworld, comma species. And it takes that Star Wars tibble and pulls out just the name, homeworld, and species variables. And that's what we get right here. Instead of all 14 of those variables that we had on the last slide, now we just have those three that we asked for. Very simple. Um, and I think a little easier than like using the brackets or the dollar sign or that kind of thing. Filter is another one of these verbs. Filter picks out rows. So we can tell it, I want to just see the rows that satisfy some condition. So in this case, we can call filter on the Star Wars tibble and tell it just species equal to droid. If you're, if you're used to programming or coding, you've probably seen this before where you, uh, sometimes you need to use the double, do, uh, uh, double equals sign when you're wanting to do like a comparison. Uh, so in this case, we need to use the double equals sign here because we're comparing species to droid and we're telling filter just pull out the rows corresponding to species equal to droid. And so that, that's what we see here. We end up with just six, uh, six observations, six characters that are droids. C3P, C3PO, R2D2, uh, BB-8, and so on. Um, but it's keeping all 14 variables. Because in this particular instance, we haven't told it to just look at a, a subset of the, we haven't used select here. We used select on the last slide, but we didn't, save a new object with that select. So it's going back to that original Star Wars data frame tibble and just pulling out the rows for species. Another thing, uh, the, the fourth verb that we talked about was arrange, and that just changes the order of the rows. It leaves everything there in your data frame or your tibble. It just rearranges how the rows are displayed. So in this case, we can say arrange Star Wars comma name, and it's gonna alphabetize our data frame by name. So now we can see here that Akbar is at the top because Akbar uh, is first alphabetically and then so on down through Anakin and BB-8 and, and, and so on. Uh, all 87 rows are still there. All 14 variables are still there. We've just changed the ordering of them. 
Of course, you usually don't wanna do just one thing. You wanna do multiple things to your data set, sometimes all at once. And so we can just nest functions inside of each other to perform multiple functions kind of all at one time. So uh, for example, we, ju I, we just went through selecting three variables, filtering on just droid species, and then arranging by name alphabetically. We can do that all in one line. We just kind of have to nest those functions inside of each other. So for example, uh, you know, this, is, this gets kind of hard to read, but we kind of want to think about starting on the inside and working out. So we're going to start with Star Wars and we're going to select name, homeworld, and species. Then the resulting data frame there is the first argument to filter. We're going to filter on species equals droid. Take that resulting tibble or data frame. That will be the first argument into arrange. And then we're going to arrange by name. As you can see here, this gets kind of long and unwieldy and spilled off my page even. But uh, R was still able to do it, even though it's not showing up on the slide. And we end up with this six observation, three variable data frame of just the droids uh, organized by, uh, by name alphabetically. I think that gets a little difficult to read and understand. Some people might have other ways of writing this code, something like what we have down here where you put each function on its own line, but I think that's, under, that's kind of difficult to understand too. So Tidyverse introduces a new way to do this. It's called the pipe. And the pipe makes sequence, a sequence of functions or operations much more readable. And essentially the idea is it allows you to put each new step on its own line and so then you can kind of just start at the top and work through step by step instead of having to work inside out the way that we did on that last slide. And what a pipe is, it's this kind of weird syntax here where it's a percent sign and then a right caret thing and then another percent sign. But what, what, what it's doing is it's telling, like if we pass X and then a pipe and then some function Y, that's the same as saying function X comma Y. This might seem more confusing at first, but trust me, this is gonna be way better once you see it in, in, in action here. So let's just try filtering using a pipe, right? What we can do is we can start with our tibble. Instead of having to start with the function, we start with the tibble. We say Star Wars, pipe. And then on the next line, we can say filter species equals droid. The pipe is gonna know, I wanna take that thing on the left-hand side, the Star Wars, and plug that in where the first argument should be in filter and then make species equals droid essentially the second argument. And so we get exactly that same filtering that we had before. Uh, we've just kind of specified it in a different way. That still might not be obvious why pipes are better, but let's see what happens if we wanna do all three of those functions at one time using a pipe. What can we do? We can start with Star Wars pipe it into the select, and then within the select function, we just have to pick our variables, name, homeworld, and species. If we just stopped there, that would result in our Star Wars data frame, data frame or tibble with three variables, but then we're gonna take that and pipe it again into the filter function and filter on species equals droid. If we stopped there, now we'd have those three variables just for the observations where species equals droid. But we can take that tibble and pipe it one more time into the arrange uh, verb or function and arrange by name. And so we're doing all three of these steps just like we did a few slides ago where things were nested. But I think this does it in a way that makes it way more readable uh, and, and I think easier to code too, not only as you're trying to read it ex post, but even as you're working through it in real time, it makes it easier to just think step by step by step instead of having to nest things. So I think that's really nice. Um, so that's, we talked about four verbs. We got one more, summarize. Summarize is gonna apply a function to a group of observations. And we can use this group underscore by to specify the grouping. So that, that doesn't make a lot of sense yet. Let's actually see it here in an example. I think it will. If we, if we do start with Star Wars and pipe that into group by species, 
that's not actually changing our data frame at all. It's just telling the data frame, we want to think about essentially having chunks, kind of like sub chunks within the data frame of by, by species. And then within, within each of those chunks, let's summarize by creating mean height as the mean of all the heights in that chunk and mean mass as the mean of all the masses in that chunk. And what we're left with is now just three variables, one for species, the thing that we started by grouping, grouping by, and then for each of those species, a mean height and a mean mass. Um, we could have grouped by, I don't know what else there was, uh, I think one of them was like what ship they were on or something like that. We could have grouped by ship and seen what's the average age of everyone on this ship versus that ship or something like that. There's, there, there's lots of flexibility here. Uh, but that's how the summarize and group by work. And that, that can be really nice when you're trying to create like summary stats, especially summary stats by groups. Uh, that, that, that's really nice. You might have noticed though, here we've got uh, a few places where NAs are showing up. I think we saw this earlier. NAs, nulls, some of these kind of weird uh, data uh, special values. R has a few of these that I just want to point out because you will encounter them. Uh, when you see NA, that means missing value. Uh, it just means there's, it's, it's not that it's, uh, uh, it just means that it's missing. If you're used to stata, that would just be a dot normally is what shows up there. Then there's NAN, which is not a number, which can happen if you like try to divide by zero or something like that. Null is different from NA. Null just means undefined. It doesn't mean this thing is missing. It just means it's like a, an object that has nothing defined, that has no definition yet. It's just kind of like a empty as opposed to being missing. And then finally, we can get infinity and negative infinity. I think we already saw a negative infinity show up at once. And, and so those are uh, obviously infinity and negative infinity. So one thing, there we go. One thing you might want to do is let's try to get rid of those NAs that showed up a couple slides ago when we were finding mean height and mass. The reason we had NA showing up is because somewhere in our data frame or our tibble was an NA. And so when you try a missing value and R's default is to say, when I see a missing value and I'm trying to take the mean, I'm just gonna return a missing value. The other thing we can tell it to do is just skip those NAs. And we can do that. This is, this is the same code from I think two slides ago. I've just added this extra na.rm equals true. That's saying na remove is essentially what that stands for. And we're setting that equal to true. So we're telling it, let's remove all of the, the na's when we're doing this calculation. And so now we can see here that we've, we've managed to, to avoid any na's, although we've introduced a new problem. We have an nan, a not a number. And if you go back and you try to figure out what's happening here, it turns out none of the Chagrian, sorry, this is, this is a Star Wars species that I'm not even familiar with. Uh, but anyway, apparently we don't know the mass of any of those species. So we can't take, uh, even if we, or because we ignore the, the missing values, we're left with nothing. And so implicitly we're trying to take a mean over zero things. We're trying to divide by zero and, and we're, we're left with not enough. So um, we've managed to fix a couple of our NA problems, but we've introduced a not a number problem there instead. Um, so, so that's just one thing to be aware of. If you're trying to take the mean of things with NAs, you get an NA. If you try to take the mean of nothing, you get an NAN. Um, so that's what I have for kind of this, this R tutorial. I hope that kind of, uh, especially if you've already watched or gone through those swirl tutorial. Uh, I hope that that has kind of reinforced a few things and shown you a little bit about what R can do and why it's, I think it's so great to use. Um, if, you're, if you've got the slides in front of you or the R code in front of you, there is still a long list of other, of other stuff here. I'm not going to record those videos. We're going to talk about those in class uh, together or you can work through them on your own to see the exa an example of using R to uh, run some regressions or actually code up your own regression estimator or to then finally uh, create a function uh, that, that codes up a, a, an OLS regression estimator. So um, sorry, this one ran a little long. There's a lot of really interesting and cool data things that we can do in R, so I wanted to cover them all and it just ran a little long, um, it, it, but I hope it was worth it. 
and I hope you check out the uh, R, the rest of the R uh, slides and code that we have posted.